Hello, everyone. Welcome to the SAG AFRA Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Jacqueline Coley, and I'm an editor at Rotten Tomatoes. The SAG AFRA Foundation has a COVID-19 relief fund to support SAG AFRA artists with basic needs like rent, food, healthcare costs during this global pandemic and industry shutdown. Donations are 100% tax deductible and directly support performers in dire need. Information on how you can support this effort can be found in the description of this video. Let's go ahead and welcome the cast of Charm City Kings. I am so excited to chat with them about this film. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey. Hey. Thank you for us. <laughs> yes. Um, as I was just saying, like before we started filming, um, this the, the film has been through a lot. Uh, I saw it in one of the last times it was kind of safe to gather with people at Sundance. <laughs> and then um, everything sort of shifted. But I just want to ask each of you, because the film was intended to come out earlier, but now it's coming out at a moment where I think everything about it shifts just slightly. So if you could maybe talk about what you're excited for folks to see it now in this current moment. And Jahi, I'll start with you. Okay, well, I'll say for one, I think that um, I really think that the the imagery of a young black boy being um, at the center of a story like this definitely speaks volume, um, given where we are at, uh, in our society. Um, but I particularly enjoy the fact that we're uh, entering into this world, into the city that's often vilified and often overly politicized, but we're entering it through the eyes of this minuscule being um, who sort of uh, has this whole world in, in the palm of his hand. So um, I, I agree with what you said. It, it does change slightly, but I think the core of the film and the core themes uh, about friendship and identity and police brutality even and toxic masculinity, all of those themes are, are, are still the same as they were if it came out last year or earlier in this year. Um, but it, it absolutely does hit a little different given where we are right now as a, as a culture. Yeah, and Tiana? <laughs> Um, well, the baby said all of the great things. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. I think for me, it, all of that in place, but also adding like, it's been such a relief to see my, uh, vis uh, images of ourself on the screen. Um, almost like a, a getaway the, from everything that's happening in the real world. But this one is also heavy <laughs> it becomes heavy but you get to escape with these characters and these kids and their lives and just watching how, like like uh what was said like just watching how they have the whole world ahead of them and then how quickly it can change it's just um it's been crazy because it is so we are in this time right now where we're watching that happen on the news as well but um so yeah. yeah. No, it's very powerful to your point. Um, Will, do you have anything to add on that? Um, I believe that the film is timeless. Um, I think it's one of those films that will live and test and live beyond the test of time. So to me, it could have came out at any time. Um, I think it came out at the right time as far as everybody being home and you know, be able to sit in the comfort of their home and to watch these amazing performances that were put on by Jaheed and Tiana, you know. Um, so I think it's at the right time. And I believe the mentorship that you see in the film, it translates into every day right now, you know, especially my part in playing Detective Rivers. It gives the, the police officer and the law enforcement an opportunity to look at him and how he deals with the character Mouse and maybe that'll make them deal in their own lives. And when they're on the beat and when they're out there arresting folks, maybe they'll think of that mentorship. Yeah, that, yeah, again, very, again, you're right on thinking about it because it's timeless in, I guess, some of the best and worst ways because those situations are continually happening. I'll look forward to the day that it's not timeless, where people can look back on this mm -hmm. as sort of like the way we look at history books. So looking forward to that moment. Um, bringing it back to something you all touched on, which is the city of Baltimore. When I was getting ready for this, I watched a lot of your previous interviews and everybody wanted to talk to y'all about the accents. And no offense, I think that's great, but 
this is going to actors. Actors know how to put in the work. They know that that's all accents and things are. But I'm curious about the city of Baltimore and immersing yourself in that culture because I, it's more than that. I mean, there's the documentary that the film is sort of inspired by, but then also the real life Baltimore people that became part of the script. So I'm just wondering if you guys can touch on something that you did to try and really immerse yourself in the city of Baltimore and sort of bring in this extra character to your character. And Jahi, I'll start with you. Uh, well, I know, speaking for myself, I watched the documentary a lot. Um, I watched the documentary uh, more times. I, I probably know it by heart by now. So much so that I can't. <laughs> just, I, so much so that I can't just watch it just to watch it now, just because I've seen it so many times. Um, but I mean, I don't think that I had to do a lot when it came to immersing myself into Baltimore culture, um, particularly because 100% of the movie is shot in West Baltimore, and we were out there for what nine hours to 15 hours a day. So. Um, you sort of get accustomed to it. I, I, Baltimore was a character on and off screen. So every every day was an experience uh, <laughs> and it was its own story to tell. So I didn't have to do a whole lot to get immersed into the culture, but I will say um, the huge chunk of my work um, as an actor and the challenge for me was trying to play mouse um, in juxtaposition of what society thinks of him, you know, as the B-boyish, you know, sort of, um, toxic um, black young male or troubled teen and really show his humanity. Um, and I think that um, um, with the help of the really honest and genuine performances that I um, was able to sort of act alongside of, it was, it was really, um, it was made a lot easier. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Will, I'll go to you next with this question um, and ask you, was there anything from Baltimore that you maybe took with you? Maybe you found some good restaurants that you want to shout out? <laughs> Um, I'm from the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. So it's kind of like being home. Um, I think it was like Miss Shirley's in Baltimore, the breakfast spot that I ate at a lot, you know, um, got crabs with Tiana. That was dope, you know, kicked it with y'all. He had a couple different restaurants. And then in West Baltimore, they had these, uh, wings, these chicken wings that they'll put like honey on in the middle of the hood and the wings was fire. So Old Bay, Old Bay, <laughs> Old Bay wings. Yeah. I never had that before. Yeah, so the, the culture of Baltimore is very rich, you know. Um, so you 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 feel that when you're in the city. So I, I'll definitely take that away, and I'll probably get some goals at some point. I didn't get. get it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What about you, Tiana? Um, I I did get the the crab with Will. I I'm you know I know y'all talk about DMV. All y'all talk about these crabs. These crabs are not for me. They are way too much work and not enough meat. I will stick to the snow crab and the king crab. Y'all could have them little tiny dang blue crabs. Okay, now that I got that out of the way, and they, I know y'all the the Baltimore people gonna get me, but I'm sorry, it's way too much work. But as far as the character and the city and all of that. Um, I actually was able to hang out <laughs> with Coco some. Coco is the mother from the actual documentary. Oh, Lord, Coco, I love Coco. There is no one else like Coco as y'all, and we have all seen in the documentary. And I was just absorbing her, trying to absorb her as much as I could. At the end of the day, nobody can be Coco. I was not Coco. <laughs> um, I just tried to take from her experiences as of being a mother, um, of her loss, of her her um, the, her joys, her pains, the all that she so openly shared with me. I took it and tried to infuse that with who I also thought Terry was. Um, and I appreciate her for allowing me that. Um, and I also spoke to other women from Baltimore and a few other uh, just people in general. And, um, but it, everyone was willing to help. Like the different black mamas like, oh no, no, we say it like this, this Baltimore speak, this, that and all. So I just took it and wrote it all and, you know, tried to, it was, it was a, I, I was really, lucky to have people so open and honest and the you know Baltimore people they're proud they are proud and they want wanted us to represent the city well and so they were very open and welcoming um so I'm, I'm very appreciative and grateful for that 
Yeah, I mean, I would have uh, just listening to it thought you guys were Baltimore residents and I don't want to dismiss the work you guys did because it's so good. It is flawless. Like even Will, the way you sort of like just carefully put in that Baltimore accent, it wasn't as pronounced as uh, the other folks in the in the movie. I, I loved every bit of that. So very good job. Um, bring it back to you, Jahi. You mentioned this a little bit when you were talking about um, the film coming out now, but What's interesting is this is a coming of age tale. And yes, it's centered on uh, a group of individuals that aren't necessarily seen in mainstream media on a broad scale. But more importantly, for anyone who's looking at it like, okay, coming of age movies kind of hit the same beats. What about this, besides who it centers on is different from your average coming of age tale? Because I feel like this one really approaches it in a different way. That's a really good question. Um, what makes it different? Well, I'll say, for one, um, I know you said not to focus on who it centers on. I'll say the setting. Well, I'm not going to talk about the individuals. I will say that the setting um, in which it in which it centers in our story centers in does make it stand out, um, and not because it is in you know the inner cities and all of that. But like I said before, Baltimore is um, in the eyes of the media, it is overly politicized and it is heavily vilified, um, specifically the dirt bike culture. Um, and so I think that to have uh, someone who, like you said, isn't at the fore of, uh, forefront of our, however we think of um, the quintessential white um, male or suburban kid um, in the average coming of age story, I do think that the environment um, sets it apart, um, as well as the, the cultures that are attached to the specific environment, like the dirt bike culture and the Baltimore culture and the eccentricities of the people in Baltimore. Um, I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but I think no. those things are. I think those things are unique about it, and I am. Um, um, that, that's a question that I've been getting a lot, so I've been trying to sort of find a specific answer for it. But yeah. No, I think it it is really interesting. One thing that I sort of hit up on that I thought was really interesting is so often when you have black stories, there's the absentee father figure. And in mm -hmm. this story, there's two warring ones, which mm -hmm. is a different tit twist on how that is approached, especially in the mentorship, deciding who you wanna be essentially. Mm -hmm. And Will, the way you bring your character to life, like you slow play us like very like carefully through the movie and I just wanted you to maybe talk about how you were able to do that because when we get to the moment where your character finally reveals why he's committed to Mouse, um, it's just, it's such a powerful scene. Well, I, I think I grew, grew up with great mentors in my own life, you know, and even when I first met Jahi, you know, I was like, man, I love this kid. So just even in that moment, I can take that and use that because that's the way Rivers feels, you know, you find that one kid that has that spark. Not that all kids don't have a spark, but this particular kid has a spark that can go somewhere and go far. And I see that in Mouse. And so, you know, by me knowing his brother Stro and what happened in that, I'm like, I'm not going to allow this to happen to him. So I kind of see myself. And, you know, it just allowed everything to play fluid. And I always say this about Jahi. He plays the scene instead of the page. So when it, whenever you're in the scene with him, He's going to be in the scene and you have to you have to give and take what is there in the moment. So it makes it so easy if he switched and I'm like, OK, it's like playing tennis. OK, I got to hit it this way or hit it that way. So it was just, you know, just the love for him. Meeting him made me like, OK, I'm here. This is I want to I want to actually say this kid. You know what I'm saying? And then I know everything else would just it would just bubble up the chemistry on scene like it's supposed to. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was definitely there. I, that was like the biggest question I was kind of having through the beginning of it. It's like, this dude is so committed and it seems to be not really for anything in return. And so again, when it had that moment, I found it to be incredible. And especially the way you talked to Meek about it, but we'll get back to him in a minute. Um, speaking of scenes, Tiana and Jahi for this one, the scene, listen, listen. I've made my mama angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I ever would want to see my mother the way you were in that moment. And so, again, this is a going out to an audience of actors, and I'm sure they were just as wild, wild by it as I was. But really talk about the work. I mean, this is a tennis match. And, and Jahi, unfortunately, you're just kind of taking it. 
So Tiana, I'll start with you on how you, you know, <laughs> went about bringing, breaking this boy down, girl. <laughs> but there is a way to take it. So he was not just standing there and taking it. He was feeding me and giving me and there and present for me. Um, I mean, if we want to get to the real, <laughs> it's such an, you're, it's a film with kids children, underage humans who they have very strict uh, work labor laws. And so as the actor who is like, oh, we can go all day, <laughs> you know, that's just not the case. And so with that scene, um, I remember it was down to the wire. The baby was about to turn into a pumpkin and I'm looking at uh, on hell like, wow, okay, we about to do this right in like this much time, okay. So it was a matter of, I had done the work inside and all of that and this, the rapport we had built up, uh, Jahi and I had built up throughout the, the filming was there. So it was just really trying to tap in quick, like ha making sure the it, I was present. Cause I knew we were getting down to the wire as the day was dwindling away. And I was like, okay, we gonna still try to get this. It's a, it's a indie film. You gotta get what you can get when you can get it. So just in the trailer, trying to keep myself, you know, present and everything percolating. And then when I get there, Jahi's there ready. And then the other thing with this is it was a one -er with a stunt. Oh gosh, <laughs> the slap! Oh goodness, that slap! But and anyway. do you? I'm oh. sorry. Do you remember, oh, Tiana? We had to evacuate during that scene because there was like a a Did pipe the snake or something. Get out? It no, but oh. there was like a pipe or something that we had to, and it like it was like it was unhealthy to breathe or something like that. So we had to <laughs> evacuate, and we were on like the streets of West Baltimore, <sighs> standing there just talking. like oh. 12 a.m. talking like the, the 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 time is a ticking so it was a lot going on but that's also the things that I love about indie films and Jahi is such a professional and he showed up and he was present there with me knowing we were up against the time but that also kind of helps because you're like just drop in and go like whatever happens happens I can't control all of these other circumstances um but he was there for me there with me and on hell was like come on you got it we gonna get this so there were a lot of things like you know technical things that were happening around but I just tried to do the work show up prepare and had a great partner and a leader so and I just want to add because cool. I want to thank you Tiana because you told me <laughs> as this is going out <laughs> you said well make sure you have your choices together before you get to set, you're not going to get the time that you think you want, you know, so just have your you know. stuff laid up. And sometimes I'll get to set and Jahi got to leave in 10 minutes. And that's 10 a, minutes. That's another one take. You better get it. And so I appreciate, one take. You, I appreciate you. I got you. I got you. You know, we love you, Jahi, but that's just the real. You'll be in this position next time where you when you're working with, you know, this first SAG after. So actors want to hear this. But when you're working with under eight or minors, I should say that it's always come prepared. Know like Will was just saying, know what you want to try, what you want to do, because it's not about you. It really isn't. It's about what they need to get from the minors because they are on a clock. And yeah. luckily we had a minor who was a professional and was there for us just as much as we needed to be there for him. So we love that. Thanks, Bill. Um, I love this, by the way, y'all. First of all, you make my job so much easier because you can tell that you guys have a genuine camaraderie. I know everyone says they had fun on set, but what you guys just showed right there really demonstrates that the, the, the gifts that you were giving each other when y'all were making this movie. Um, and I really love that you explained the technical of the oneer because I didn't even catch that that was a oneer. But the minute you said that, I was like, "Oh, she gets another yeah, bonus for that, that because that is one <laughs> take with no cuts. That's so nuts." Um, I mean, we did but, multiple. We did multiple yeah, ones. Just yeah, know, he yeah. picked something. He <laughs> picked yeah. something. Um, but Jahi, I was going to bring it to what, what Tiana kind of said, but yeah, you're not just standing there. You definitely have to go through a lot of internal motions at the beginning of that scene. You're trying to be brash. And by the end of it, 
you're you're very much beaten down by the reality of the bed you just made. So talk about the internal acting and how it is as an actor to then play against so much coming from the other side, but still be true to what that moment is for your character. Well, uh, I again, it's a matter of using sense memory um, to, I don't know who, I don't know if that's, is that Stanislavski, who is that? I don't know, but sense of memory, uh, this is the Actors Guild, so they'll know, but um, they know. using <laughs> sense of memory um, to sort of bring about, and also other people, because I've never had a, I'm like you, Jacqueline, I've never had a blowout with my mother like that, um, but I, I definitely know some of my cousins or family members who have had um, difficult bouts and periods in the relationships with their mother, father, whoever, uh, my brother. So um, I, I, I'm able to draw upon and sort of be, like Tiana said, absorb the energy of others being an empath and being an artist. So in that moment, I was just, okay, what would so-and-so do, <laughs> you know, uh, and sort of take there and be a statue? Because, you know, there is a lot that, I'm sure there is a lot that Mouse wanted to say in that moment to lash out or whatever. But I think um, him blocking the second hit was sort of the, the physical manifestation of everything that he wanted to say, but didn't really need to because of where they were both standing. Um, and so I think, you know, just all of, with all of those things considered, I, I was able to, you know, make it as honest as possible. And I mean, to give it back to Tian as well, like I didn't have to do much. I, all I, I mean, I just had to, okay, be in the moment and just let her, go and I was like okay I'm I'm watching you because I'm like this is so good but I'm also like okay I'm supposed to be scared and conflicted it's like I don't know what I'm supposed to do and every time it's so funny because I love going to movies with us black folks because it's just it's the best experience it is the best movie going experience because every time I'm in the audience watching that scene there's a black woman in the audience like mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was that black woman at the Sundance screening. Let's keep it real on the on the black numbers at the at Park City. I probably was that woman. Trust. Like, <laughs> like when I walked in and she asked, "What is this? Is is money?" It, it, there's always that black woman like mm, m- money, like mm. you know. So <laughs> I love it, and, and that was exactly what I was thinking of what we were doing. <laughs> No, I love it. Um, Giving that good Kamala Stare vibes on that moment right there. Um, Will, I want to uh, talk about, again, another incredible scene, but mostly specifically Meek Mill, because when I watched this movie, it was the same feeling I got when I watched LeBron James and Trainwreck, which is that that's not fair. You cannot be that good at one thing and then come to this other thing and also excel. Like, no, bro, you gotta be like bad. (laughs) You have to be able to not cook, not do anything. (laughs) You can just be a rap god and that's it. But he really showed his range and like really demonstrated how he was able to bring that character to life. And y'all's scene is incredible. But talk about it from your side, because yeah, he's maybe done some stuff before, but you're acting with a less experienced actor, but a very pivotal scene and you're really warring. So how did you guys go about it? And did he ask advice or how did it go? Nah, uh, Meek didn't ask no advice. <laughs> you know, he, he uh, <laughs> in, his, in his world and in his moment, you know, um, I knew that I was the driving force in the scene. So, you know, I kind of had some things worked out in my mind. Uh, I remember Clarence though, one of the producers is to go good when everybody's in sync. I thought this, I saw this uh, baseball and I thought about grabbing it and I said, nah, I'm not going to do it. And he comes and hands it to me. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah. I wanted to use this anyway. So I start to toss the ball in the air and then I start to make my way through the scene. But by the time we get together and working with Meek, he just has a presence alone. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to act that part at all. And I just felt him every time we would do it, you know, he would get more comfortable and more comfortable and more comfortable. And then I remember telling him, I said, you know, if you really want to do this, you know, you one of those, you one of those artists that could do it, like how Pop did it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Work at it and really want to do it, you can do it because you just have that <laughs> natural ability to do it. And then he mentioned, he said, uh, he said, yeah, man, but you know, you and Nafisa, cause he know Nafisa, who's a young lady on Black Lightning, See, y'all like okay. being here all the time and doing it. Maybe when I see the movie, it'll motivate me to want to have the same passion like I have for music that y'all have for acting. But um, he was present, you know, that's that's all you can ask for in any artist. And then I don't take it as, oh, I have more experience. 
because at time as an artist that you think that you have more experience, you might miss on some, some goodness that may happen from you just being open to what the possibilities may be. So I always go into it not judging anyone, you know, and just say, okay, let's just go and let's see what happened. And that's kind of how I, my approach was with everything that I do. That's, I mean, that's an incredible way to approach it. And I think the right way to approach it. This is why I write about the movies and I don't act in them. But uh, this is, uh, it was just incredible to see what he was able to do on screen with this film. Um, Tiana, I'm gonna bring it back to you really quickly because I wanna talk about you and Jahi before the fight and the mother-daughter um, sort of balance because I think it was interesting how she was just busy and not present, but still present. And I just wondered if there was a way that you wanted to try to convey that she was still a present mother, even though the reality of her literally keeping the lights on prevented her from maybe being as close. Like when you look at the love interest, like she's like, I can't leave the porch. Like, I'm sure that's what Terry would like to do, but she can't, she can't be like that. So, so talk about that maybe right. internal conflict. Um, it was a really, we have very interesting conversations, myself and I held the director about who Terry was and where on a spectrum of possibilities she would, uh, she lands. And, you know, I felt that it was important that we didn't, um, that she was true to who, to who she is, which is her environment. Like she, she, I think Terry was somebody who was a part of this culture, who was hanging out and who was, very active in the streets until she wasn't because of her loss and when she was like oh I have to change and I, I thought I wanted to uh, what's the way to say this I didn't want to make her perfect like oh well if she yelling at her kid or hit her kid she a bad woman like nah I know that mother it's not my mother okay she She'll get me if I speak. <laughs> Anyways, it's not my mother, but I we all know that mother, be it our aunt, our grandma, whoever, who is like you want to throw certain judgments on them because of how you perceive their actions, but that's not true. What is their motivation? Where is it coming from? And Terry has to keep the lights on. She has two jobs, probably working on a third. She just physically cannot be there for her children but she's trying to be there for her children through making sure they have heat, making sure they have food. Uh, and so she's doing the best she can as a single mother. Um, and I, I thought it was important not to try to make her likable or make her politically correct um, mm -hmm. in, in what we were trying to say. I, I thought, make her human like let's see her struggles and what her um what she's fighting against and what she's fighting for um and so i i i, I like where we landed with her um you know with some negotiations <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's a, a big leap either for you to be like busy because girl, all everyone here is working, but like girl, you WandaVision and Candyman and like you sleeping? Oh, <laughs> you mean me? You I thought we were yes. Sleeping. I'm like, I'm asking oh. you if you you could relate to Terry being booked and busy, because girl, sis, <laughs> you must. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, um it's different, but thank you. Yes, <laughs> no. I'm grateful. Basically, I'm saying, please tell me secrets about WandaVision. Please whisper them in my ear. Um, <laughs> um, I have none. Just yeah, I know. It'll be exciting. <laughs> yeah, Mar Marvel puts y'all in an NDA chokehold. I've tried this for years. It never works. Um, Jahi, I'm going to bring Man. it back to you before we get out of here. Um, because we, we've mentioned him, but um, definitely want to talk about Angel because this is his first feature film, but obviously he's been working in shorts and documentaries before this. And I think that there's a kinship between you two. I saw that in the Q and A's at Sundance because it had to be. So really talk about working with him and, and how you develop that comfort level because it, it, it takes that I think for this particular role to trust that he is gonna take this black boy story and honor it. Right. Uh, well, I spent the most time out of anyone in the film, I spent the most time with Angel just because uh, he obviously directed every every moment and he was there um, with every detail. That's another thing. He's very detail oriented. Um, 
And I think one of the things that I've been saying about on Hill throughout you know, every interview that I've done throughout the, the press junket has just been that he's an artist in every sense of the word. I mean, he really embodies what it means to be artistic. And uh, I, I think maybe people remember this, but we were doing a scene where um, Mouse walks in on um, Terry in the kitchen. And in the midst of directing us, Angel began to, to cry. And um, that was an interesting moment because I, I had never quite experienced anything like that before um, with the director who was so emotionally involved in, in the story that we were telling. And so I think that knowing that it made me want to be better, um, not only for him, but for everyone who was going to watch that scene or um, experience this world and have a sense of connectivity um, to it. So uh, it, it deepened my responsibility uh, as an actor and as an artist. It's like, okay, I have to, I have to really show up and uh, show out. But um, he, um, he is uh, a brilliant, incredible director and I, and I would love to work with him again. And I mean, the magic and the, the colorful nature of this film is really due to Angel and his, his vision. So shout out to Think one thing before we before we end because okay I, so sorry I just don't want this to be taken the wrong way when I meant by the film being timeless it's timeless like a boys in the hood for the message and the principles that it has in it not timeless that we want to continue to see for least brutality I just want oh to obviously that. oh I took it that way oh, I took it that way yeah I totally took it that way but I appreciate the clarification because yeah no just. <laughs> I mean, but like, that's why these are such great, almost like anthropological time capsules. We can go back to that time in a film and say, this was the situation. And again, very much moved past it. So, you know, that's why they preserve films in the Library of Congress because they speak to this stuff. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Um, and again, I wanna thank all of you for joining uh, us today at the Conversations at Home and uh, um, thank you, everyone. And on behalf of the SAG Afro Foundation, we want to thank you for joining us and sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow artists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.